Hi, I'm Mac, and today I'm gonna talk about Pokemon, because someone has to. You tell us something your mom doesn't know. Yeah. Oh. Don't bite that. The Pokemon franchise launched in 1996 in Japan with Pokemon Red and Green for the Nintendo Game Boy. But who cares? You knew that already. Listen, Pokemon is the world's number one highest grossing media franchise, and it created the creature collecting genre. Now I use the term created loosely here, I'm sure Pokemon isn't the first ever piece of media to fit the bill. That title might go to the Shin Megami Tensei series, but Pokemon absolutely popularized it. I mean, do you think people would still be making so many creature collectors today if not for Pokemon's success? But before I go on, it's important that I describe exactly what I mean here by creature collector. Creature Collector is a sort of a vague term for an unofficial genre of games. You'll also hear people call it names like uh, monster taming, monster raising, or monster collecting, to which I say, first of all, name calling is mean, and second of all, creature collecting has alliteration, and Steam agrees with me. Anyway, the term is pretty self-explanatory. Creature collector games are games where you can collect a number of creatures by befriending, hatching, breeding, growing, taming, whatever. Usually, these are RPGs aimed towards younger audiences that involve using your creatures to battle other creatures, often in a turn-based format, but as I said, this is an unofficial genre, so it's pretty loose. Regardless, the main appeal is collecting creatures and using them for whatever the game offers. That's kind of all it really takes to be called a creature collector. Now, a lot of the time, people will see a creature collector game like Yokai Watch, for instance, and go, hey, a Pokemon clone, which isn't fair to Pokemon, and it's especially not fair to the game you're talking about. After the release of the original Doom, people were calling every single first-person shooter out there a Doom clone until around the late 90s. Now, doesn't that seem just silly today? Anyway, it's not fair to creature collectors to just be dismissed as some clone. Unless they are just a clone. Yeah, mobile devices, Steam, and even eShops are oversaturated with blatant Pokemon ripoffs that add almost nothing in terms of originality. Let's not confuse that with the real deal. Alright, here's my disclaimer. I got into Pokemon when I was around 9 years old, so there's no denying that there's a heavy nostalgia factor to the series and by proxy the genre for me. Pokemon Heart Gold wasn't my first game, but it was the game that got me into gaming. That being said, nobody bitches about Pokemon like a Pokemon fan. I found a lot of more recent Pokemon entries pretty disappointing, and while I'm not sure if this is because they're actually getting worse or because I'm just aging, it's obvious there was a severe lack of innovation to the formula up until Legends... Arceus. Ar Arceus. Which was a leap in the right direction, but still had its faults. Like, looking like shit. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet were announced this year, and considering that they're apparently committing to a new non-linear open-world format with graphics that finally are starting to look like they belong in this generation, the future looks really promising. But the game isn't out yet, so let's reserve judgment. At this point, you're probably saying to yourself, Mac, are you just gonna complain about Pokemon the whole time? Get to the point. To which I say, Will do, but please be nice to me. There's a whole world of games that aren't Pokemon for us to discover. So, I'm gonna start reviewing creature collector games, because I love them, and I also love sorting and comparing things, which really speaks to my neuroticism. Basically, what we're gonna do is review each game or game series by breaking it down in terms of the traits that make a creature collector a creature collector. Once we've got enough research under our belts, maybe you guys can help me take a crack at drafting up our own idea for the perfect creature collector game. So let's check out the key points that I came up with that I think will be useful for reviewing and comparing these creature collector games. How many times did I say creature collector just now? 
First up is the number of creatures. This is the most straightforward category. While having more creatures doesn't necessarily equate to having more fun, having a robust roster can definitely be a plus, especially for those who enjoy the collecting aspect of these games. So, I've got my handy dandy chart here to keep track of how many creatures a game has, from a scale of Just Dance 4 to Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Next is creature designs. This is the most subjective category here for sure. I'll just be taking a peek at the creature designs and rating them on aesthetics and creativity overall. There's some specifics to pay attention to though. In my opinion, there are three basic design types of creatures that you can collect in creature collecting games. There are the silly creatures, like these Pokemon, for example. They're funny looking little guys that might be based off of puns or inanimate objects, or maybe they're just kind of spirits. Yokai Watch is full of these, for example. They don't look much like any real life creature in particular, and they really don't look like they could exist in real life and follow the laws of biology. The second type is the beasts. These are the animal-like critters based off of existing or even mythological creatures. Maybe they're outlandish, but they're more or less believable and much less silly than the first type. The third type is people. As a kid, I was of the mindset that the silly creatures were super lame. I wanted to take the world seriously, and it was way cooler to daydream about my adventures with my team of loyal and powerful beasts than it was to daydream about traveling with f***ing Bellsprout. Now though, I've learned to really appreciate the funnier looking guys and enjoy the game without taking it too seriously. Another thing worth noting in creature designs is what I'm gonna call, for lack of a better word, personality. Of course, personality is a good thing, but too much personality in a creature will seem more like a character than a member of a species. We see this in some recent starter evolutions in Pokemon, where Cinderace is a rambunctious soccer player, Inteleon is a sly secret agent, and Incineroar is a macho wrestler heel who plays dirty. These are fun characters that are great for marketing, but they no longer feel like creatures that you can catch and make your own, each one with a different story. This is more of a personal opinion though, so it won't affect grading too much. Besides these categories, there's another thing we need to look out for in the designs. Yeah, this isn't something we see in Pokemon, but it's not uncommon in other creature collectors. It's not like rare shinies, which are exactly the same as their common variants in every classification, or regional variants, who more or less tend to have totally different designs and concepts. What they'll do is grab a creature, palette swap it, slap a new typing on it, and maybe a minor frill or two, and call it a new creature. It's a cheap and lazy way to pad out the roster. It's like if I dyed my hair and changed my major and everyone started calling me Jim all of a sudden. Next category is obtaining creatures. How do you get the creatures? Catch em or hatch em, it's a pretty significant part of the game, so it'd better be fun. I'll mention any possible breeding systems here too. The next category is about starters and legendaries. Your very first creature is an important one, it's your first impression, and it's probably going to stay in your party for at least a little while, so it's more than likely you'll form an attachment to it. In Pokemon, starters become mascots for each generation. You can pick one of three, and they evolve to be pretty powerful. But other creature collectors might treat your first creature as more of a weak first step on a path to greater things. Then there's the legendary type of creatures. Even if they're not explicitly referred to as legendary, there's probably going to be a really powerful creature that the game sort of leads up to. One so cool that you're desperate to catch it and add it to your team. Next is encounters in battle. Without delving too deep, I'll take a surface level look at battling systems, which will more often than not be of the turn-based variety, but you might be surprised to see that some of these games don't really involve battling at all. Next is bonus creature activities. What extra stuff can you do to bond with your creatures? Petting them, feeding them, riding them around, mini games? This kind of thing can go a long way in giving your creatures personality. Some people like to differentiate between monster collecting and monster raising games, so it's important to make the distinction as to which mechanic a game focuses on more. After all, the more time you spend raising a creature, the less disposable it feels. 
Next is elements or types. What differentiates creatures from each other besides just their stats? Is there any reason to switch out your creatures in battle or other situations, or can you just power through the whole game with one guy without much of a struggle? Next is unused creatures. When you're not using a creature as part of your party, do you just shove it away in storage and leave it to rot, or can you still do something with it? There's potential in free labor there, right? My favorite approach that I've seen is the Pokepelago in Pokemon Sun and Moon, where your PC Pokemon are sent away to frolic on a remote paradise island. That's just like what happened with my dog! Next up is Evolution. Evolution is a fun way to show progress, power up your creatures, and make you really feel like you've raised something yourself. It's kind of a staple in these kind of games. Next is Multiplayer. Multiplayer trading and battle are a huge part of the Pokemon games. The whole reason there's two versions of each game is to encourage trading, and honestly, playing the brand new Pokemon games at the same time as your friends, talking about it at recess, trading and battling on the playground, that was a great experience as a kid. Other games might even take things a step further and let you explore dungeons or fight bosses with your friends. Marketable, kids, crap. Like I said, Pokemon is the highest grossing media franchise of all time, and the revenue made from the games probably barely makes a dent. It's all about the merchandise, and yeah, this is straying from the original purpose of rating and discussing the video game itself, but I think this kind of thing is significant. Games like these can be made with the express purpose of selling toys in mind. Merchandise can have a bigger impact on the game than you think. The creature collecting genre is pretty inextricably intertwined with landfills. So I'll take a quick look at any animated shows, comics, figurines, trading card games, and other merch of note. This isn't even half of what I got. I'm a f***ing sucker. Fishing minigame. Yes or no, I've got places to be. Alright, this video has been kind of all over the place, but more than anything, it's a sign of cool things to come, so get excited for future videos. I know, these kinds of games can be pretty complex, so if you have any corrections or criticism of my criteria, well, keep them to yourself.